Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Robert Audi, in his article, Virtue Ethics as a Resource in Business, towards the end is going to talk about five contexts for using virtue ethics, and indeed virtue ethics, or aritaic concepts in business ethics, but also more broadly speaking, because it's good to remember that business is not the only domain of a business person's life, right? So virtue ethics would help to address uh, other aspects, other domains of life, and help one to become a more integrated person. When we're talking about virtue ethic concepts, these include the virtues and also their opposites, the vices. And these can be quite helpful for thinking about moral reasoning, decision making, and development in a number of different ways. So one that's particularly basic is what we can call the context of aspiration. And he says um, one question that we can ask, and people do ask this, very often in, in the course of their life is, what kind of a person do I want to be? What kind of person do I really want to be? Do I want to be the kind of person who actually has good moral qualities? Or do I want to be the kind of person who fakes it and gets away with stuff and then has to look at themselves in the proverbial mirror later on, who always has to be a bit worried about other people finding out that they're, they're a fraud in, in moral terms. Or, you know, maybe they're not bothered by that, in which case they can say, I just want to be ruthless, in which case they may not have that much connection with virtue ethics, but it can still be useful to clarify for themselves that they're not going to have much to do with it any sort of ethics really when it comes down to it. Most people, if you ask them what kind of person do they want to be, there's going to be a disconnect between the person that they know themselves to be at this point in time and the person that they like themselves to be. And they don't usually, unless they're you know a bit misguided, bring up vices like saying, I want to be a more unjust person. I want to be a less generous person, a more stingy person or a more uh, spendthrift person, they usually say things like, well, I want to be you know, more well-integrated. I want to be more diligent. I want to improve my work ethic. I want to be more just with, with other people, more fair, more honest. And so the, the virtues can help to clarify for us what kind of people we want to be, and also what kind of people we want other people to be. If we say, what kind of leaders do we want? Or what kind of workers do we want? Or what kind of people on our own level, peers, co-workers, do we want to have? We often will use virtue terms for that. So that's, that's one thing. And this leads quite naturally into what he calls the context of prohibition, meaning saying, don't be like this kind of person. Don't be a bad person in these Respects. And so, you know, this is actually, I'm going to read this as a great line. He says, uh, the power of pejoratives is not to be understood, underestimated, especially in their noun forms in which their application suggests a vice or serious defect of character. It is at best a rare person who does not have a deep aversion to be being called things like liar, cheat, coward, brute, bully, thief, turncoat, fraud, or phony. Some of these are a little old-fashioned, right? Uh, Audi is, is uh, writing this quite a while back. We can come up with lots of other things. Inauthentic, right? Uh, a grifter. And he says, such labels are generally rejected even by such offenders as the perpetrators of the Enron and WorldCom scandals. Even they didn't want people saying bad stuff about them. As a matter of fact, they'd often retaliate or be very defensive and try to justify their clearly immoral behavior because they didn't want to be called that sort of stuff. 
Now, it's one thing just to call people names. It's another thing to do so in a way where you say, this actually sticks. You have this vice. This is part of what's wrong with you. This is part of what's bad about the corporate culture you developed. So clarifying these negative terms, what is it to be a greedy person? What is it to be a dishonest person, right? What is it to be a cheat? These are things that virtue ethics can help us clarify. Then we have uh, correlative to this, the context of exhortation. He says, nearly everyone wants to be considered honest, fair, loyal, just, sincere, kind, generous, these sorts of things. These should be developed in moral education. And some of these figure into major moral principles. And so, you know, they're appropriate for, uh, like he says, teaching ethics, critically appraising actions, leading employees. They're also appropriate to institutional mission statements, although oftentimes mission statements are a little bit bland and underdeveloped in this respect. Um, so we can, we can clarify and advocate what positive traits we think a person ought to have. Somebody might answer the question, what kind of person do you want to be? What excellences should you have? And leave some out. And then we can say, well, you know, this is really good. You're working on the honesty part. I'd like you also, maybe in a coaching session we say this, I'd like you also to work on the diligence part, like actually following through or perseverance, sticking to a task and going all the way to the end. It's really nice that you have great ideas. It's really nice that you get along with your coworkers. This is an area that we'd like to see you working on. And so we exhort, we urge people to develop these, these areas. Then we have the context of what he calls discovery. And he says, we can reflect on what it is to have a given virtue. We can ask how various role models who have a virtue have acted or would have acted. We can look to narratives, historical or fictional. All of these are modes of discovery, figuring out what the virtue actually looks like. Or we can also say looking, what does the vice look like? Or what does it look like to be a person who lacks character and kind of wavers between virtues and vices as well? Those are all helped out by looking not just to abstract concepts of virtue, but to places where virtues are displayed and talked about and depicted. Um, so he says that all of these help us to uh, decide what kind of person we want to be, or less broadly, what kind of business person we want to be. Then finally, we have the context of what he calls justification. And this doesn't mean just like sort of justifying yourself in a defensive way. This means explaining the actions that somebody is engaged in to say they, they actually are doing virtuous actions, actions either in accordance with virtue or actions stemming from virtue. Uh, from a disposition that one has actually developed within oneself or correlatively vicious actions. You know, this is a bad action because it's a greedy action. The person isn't actually a greedy person, but they have decided to act like a greedy person in this context. We want to be able to say and explain how that's the case. And this is going to, as he points out, involve combining moral and non-moral concepts. Oftentimes, bringing up relevant and specific facts. So, you know, he says, when it comes to justifying moral judgments and moral decisions, virtue ethical statements like it was the just solution and loyalty to man standing by her, even though she made the wrong decision, have a kind of incompleteness. We need to know what else to add in there in order to provide an explanation or justification. And so we use these virtue terms and concepts which should correspond to realities that we experience and develop within ourselves, hopefully the virtuous ones, not the vicious ones. Uh, we use these in all of these different contexts to engage in moral decision-making within life contexts, but also within business contexts as well. And so virtue ethics offers uh, resources for doing this well within business contexts and situations.